a kind introduction. Um, hi everyone, see you again. Uh, my name is Wesley at INSEAD. Um, today we're extremely honored to have uh, Dr. Ajay Agarwal uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Agarwal is the Jeffrey Tabor Chair in Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University of Toronto's Raman School of Management. Uh, traditional, uh, traditionally, his research has centered around science policy, entrepreneurial finance, and the geography of innovation. And in recent years, he has developed a tremendous interest in artificial intelligence. I think that's evidenced by uh, the many papers and books he has published. And in particular, he has published a book titled The Prediction Machines. Uh, that book is sitting um, on, my, on my office desk, so I highly recommend everyone to read that book. Um, so just a, a few words before Ajay gets started. Um, just to emphasize, the ENS Insight Series uh, webinars um, is not a typical academic talk uh, in the sense that uh, the topics are rooted in research, but at the same time also caters. They also cater to the uh, practitioner crowd as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce, uh, uh, let Jay introduce himself, and he's going to talk about uh, his work with the Creative Disruption Lab today. Thank you, Jay. Okay, thanks very much, Wesley. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this. And Wesley, can you just let me know if you can hear me okay? Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for everybody who's um, logged in uh, that's uh, interested in this work that we're doing at Creative Destruction Lab. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a professor at University of Toronto at the Rotman School and have been working on this. Uh, this has really been an, a, an implementation of... Uh, my research and the research of, in fact, many people like who I can see on this uh, Zoom call, um, people working in innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I suspect you'll see fingerprints of um, many of your colleagues in the design of how this program works, including a number at, uh, that are with me at the Rotman School, uh, Avi Goldfarb, Joshua Gans, Mara Letterman, uh, and a num number of others. So this is not going to be a traditional uh, academic seminar. Uh, I won't be presenting a research paper here. Wesley's asked me to talk about the Creative Destruction Lab to explain how it works and the pedagogical design of how we integrate uh, MBA students and uh, entrepreneurship uh, classes in the, in the lab. So um, <clears throat> let me start with that. Uh, the design of the lab is motivated by a puzzle. And the puzzle is that um, if you were to be in outer space and look down at planet Earth, and what you were looking at was the geographic distribution of capital. Uh, so capital that goes into early, uh, early stage science-based companies, you know, tech companies. Uh, what you would see, uh, as you know, is a very big spike over uh, Northern California, Silicon Valley, and then uh, some smaller uh, bumps in other cities. Um, but if you were looking from the same place in outer space, and rather than looking at the geographic distribution of capital, you were looking at the geographic distribution of scientific breakthrough ideas, uh, the distribution would look very different. Uh, there would be uh, a reasonable size hill over Northern California, but equal sized hills over many other, over many other cities, particularly once their population adjusted. And so that raises the, the question of if science-based innovations are the seed corn for uh, science-based startups, then why is the distribution of capital so skewed? And uh, there's all sorts of uh, ex you know, explanations that have been put forward on the, for this. Uh, I'd say three of the more popular ones. Some people say, well, they, they're just better ideas in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's empirically not true using the normal metrics, uh, you know, citation-weighted patents and publications and so on. Um, another explanation is, uh, well, there's more effort, more entrepreneurial hustle in the Bay. Uh, that may be partly true, but it's certainly not the, the, the full story. There's a lot of hustle for people uh, working to commercialize what they've invented in many other places. Um, a third explanation is, while there are massive pools of capital up and down Sand Hill Road and in San Francisco, and that investors like to deploy their capital uh, within a you know, one or two hour driving radius of their uh, office. And again, that might be partly true um, in terms of explaining why there's such a great concentration, 
but it can't be again the full story. Uh, there have been a number of studies and just you know, anecdotal evidence that, for example, in Canada we had something called the labor-sponsored venture funds in the 80s that significantly dropped the cost of capital for the early stage asset classes um, and had almost no effect on the commercialization of scientific inventions in the country in that period relative to others. Uh, so it's not those things that is really driving um, the disparity in commercializing and financing early stage tech startups. What is it? And the, uh, the area that we've chosen to focus on at the lab is on uh, what we call judgment. Uh, and so the thesis is that uh, while it's not the, the only reason, a key reason for failure in the formation, financing, and management of early stage companies is a failure in the market for judgment. And how we define judgment here is very simple, uh, which is that uh, you can think of it as the ability to prioritize. Uh, and so just the same way that um, PhD students that are working with their supervisors, that one of the key things the supervisors do for PhD students is help them prioritize. Um, in other words, you know, doctoral students often have many uh, uh, interesting ideas and lots of paths they could go down. And one of the key roles of the supervisor is to help them prioritize, uh, you know, which things are most important. Same with the, <clears throat> same with the entrepreneur. Uh, so the entrepreneur, um, you know, typically the types of, that we're focused on, which are, are scientists and vendors, uh, they are deeply knowledgeable in their domain of expertise. Uh, their technical domain of expertise, but they've never built a business. And so, um, you know, the idea here is that when an entrepreneur wakes up in the morning, they have a thousand things on their to-do list that they could be doing to build their business, but they don't have the bandwidth to do all those thousand things. So they have to pick from the list. And typically they pick a few things, they work on them for a few months, and then they realize, oops, those aren't the right things. And so they go back to the list, they pick a few more things, they work on them for a few months, and oops, those aren't the right things either. And they go through that cycle a number of times, and very often, you know, they ultimately uh, run out of energy, uh, run out of capital, run out of sanity, and the you know the project uh, the project concludes, which is you know statistically the most likely outcome. And and the essence there is um, the the inability to identify what are the things that will most reduce the risk or that will most increase the probability of success at each stage uh, of developing a business. And uh, our thesis was that the people who have the best judgment are the people who have done it before. So just like in our profession, where we would never have somebody super supervise a PhD student who themselves hasn't written a PhD thesis, who themselves hasn't published multiple articles, uh, it doesn't matter how many articles a person's read. We would never say, well, a person, this person's read 50 articles, so therefore they can, they can supervise a graduate student. Um, supervisors of graduate students are people who've done it before, who have actually written papers. In our view, uh, our thesis was same in building a business. So, for example, the people that we thought would have the best judgment are the people who have done it before, who have themselves built businesses. So for example, not venture capitalists, most of them have not built a business, not uh, business school professors, most of us have never built a business, uh, not consultants, not government bureaucrats that advocate for entrepreneurship programs, um, and so on. But there'd be people who have actually gone from having an idea to building a prototype, to raising capital, uh, putting together a team, generating revenues, growing the revenues, building the business, and ultimately harvesting the value from their asset through some kind of liquidity event, taking the company public or selling the business. So what we look for in the early design of the program were people that have this judgment. And the problem that we were trying to solve was a failure in the market for judgment. So the idea there is that, uh, let's say if you're a 28 year old PhD student at the University of Toronto, and you come up with some clever idea to how to organize the world's information in a different way uh, so that you can build a, a business to compete with Google, but you've never built a business before. You can't go downtown uh, to downtown Toronto and buy five units of judgment to help you build a business. It's not for sale. 
And so therein lies the problem that uh, there's people who need judgment, the uh, first time technology entrepreneur, people who have judgment, the people who have themselves previously built successful tech companies, but there is a ill-functioning market to facilitate uh, the, the interaction between them both. Uh, the exception of that is, of course, Silicon Valley, where we, our view was that this market functions very well um, and for some reason functions much less well in most other places. Okay, <clears throat> and so just to give you an example of what we're thinking about in terms of judgment, this is an email that was written uh, by a graduate student to the Technology Licensing Office at Stanford um, a little over 20 years ago. And in this email, the graduate student says, hey, I've come up with this invention and we'd like to license it uh, to Excite. As some of you remember Excite was a, an ISP back in the day. So the student down at the bottom of this first part of the email says, this is how much it costs us to build this thing at Stanford. They do some back of the envelope calculations. They estimate a half a million bucks. And you can see in the first row of their calculation, uh, they estimate the value of their time as a graduate student to be about $100,000 a year. Then um, in the next part of the email, they say, here's the benefits to Excite if they license this from us. And they estimate about $7 million in the first year of benefit to Excite. And you can see the, the handwritten notes of the student in the right side where they uh, comment on, write down some comment from a fellow named Vinod. Then they go on to say, here's the losses to Excite if they don't license this technology from us. And they estimate a couple million bucks. And then the student goes on to say, uh, here's my proposal. Uh, I'd like to work full time exclusively for Excite for seven months until August 24. And the reason the student specifies August 24 is because uh, they go to the Burning Man Festival. And so they wanna be done uh, in time to go to Burning Man. And then they say they want to be able to move back into, go back to school in the fall in the 97 academic year. They wanna continue consulting for one day a week after they go back to school until August 24th the next year, because they go to Burning Man every year. In fact, they still do. And they want to be able to do all that while they remain a student. And they would like a bonus if they can implement the system within three months. And then they conclude their email like this. They say, here's how you can pay us uh, to the technology licensing office. They're saying that Excite can pay by cash, by stock, by salary, which is you can see what they prefer, or uh, they could take the technology and roll it into their own company, which is what this fellow Vinod is proposing. Uh, now, most people on this call will already know um, uh, who the student was and what they ended up doing. And as you know, they ended up um, not taking the salary like they preferred, but instead following the judgment of Vinod and rolling the technology into their own company and calling the company Google. And what we find so remarkable about that email is how unremarkable it is. In other words, today, so many people, when they're referring to the founders of Google, Larry and Sergey, they say, you know, these guys are so smart, they're brilliant. Uh, they are amongst, you know, the, the, uh, that generation's greatest business leaders. But if you go back and read the text of that original email, there's not an ounce of genius in that email. Any student from any university could have written that email. The only thing that makes that a Silicon Valley email is the handwritten notes in the margin, the Vinod Kosla notes that are conveying the judgment of somebody who's meeting with students that early in the process and giving them their judgment of how to, the, the very first steps in how to uh, deal with their, in this case, their IP and uh, roll it into their own company rather than to license it. Okay, so on to Creative Destruction Lab. Uh, Creative Destruction Lab is not an incubator. It's not an accelerator. There's no physical space for Creative Destruction Lab. It's a seed stage program. It's nine months long, which is just aligned with the academic year. And, um, and it consists effectively of five days. So even though it's nine months long, the, the program is really just five days. And it's one day every two months. And you can think of that one day as the judgment day. That's the day where we effectively create this market for judgment. We create a platform that we, 
that was designed in an attempt to solve the, the market failure for judgment. And I'll explain how that will work. The essence of what will happen on those days is what we call objective setting. So objective setting is a process uh, that is not very complex, uh, but is very specifically focused on trying to um, create a robust market for setting objective, that, the point I made at the beginning about an entrepreneur waking up and having a list of a thousand things and not knowing which things to, to focus on, those objectives are the things to focus on. And they are designed to in eight week chunks. So you can think of them as an eight week sprint. Every eight weeks, there's a new set of three objectives and those objectives become the focus for the next eight week sprint. And what the CD, the Creative Destruction Lab does is it's created a marketplace to enable a robust decision-making process around those three objectives every eight weeks. So how it works is uh, every cohort is 25 startups. The startups can come from anywhere in the world. So every Creative Destruction Lab, there's eight Creative Destruction Labs now at different universities. Uh, they're at Oxford in the UK and HSA Paris um, in France, uh, five in Canada and at Georgia Tech in the US. And uh, so each of these uh, sites has one or more cohorts. Uh, so a cohort is tw 25 startups and those startups can come from anywhere in the world. Um, and so what happens is a week before one of these meetings where we have five of them a year, we call them sessions. Um, a week before a session, the, these mentors receive a, a package, a dossier that has information on the 25 companies in that portfolio. And the way you can think of that information is think of it as the list of a thousand things that the company thinks they, they could be doing to move the company forward. It's not really a list of a thousand things, but that captures the essence of what that document is. So what these mentors do is they read through the list and they think to themselves, if this was my company, what three things would I focus on in the next eight weeks? What would I view as the greatest priorities that would most increase the probability of success or conversely, most reduce the risk of failure in the next eight weeks? Then on the day of the session, everybody, let's say for this one's in Toronto, everybody flies to Toronto because the fellows themselves, the mentors um, are located around the world themselves. They fly into Toronto, all the startup founders fly into Toronto, and in the morning of a session day, they meet in a room like this uh, in the morning. At, uh, and what's happening here is that the fellows are asking questions to further refine down their, their view of what those three objectives should be. Um, and what they've got is a document. This is a copy of a document um, of a company uh, that would be in their package. And what you see is the founders of the company have proposed what they think the three objectives should be. So the founders say, here's what we think should, the three things should be uh, that we should focus on. Um, and then up further in the document, they report, here's what the three objectives were in the last meeting and whether or not they've been completed. In this case, all three are complete, but very often there might be one that's complete and two that are incomplete. And then down at the bottom of this sheet that, they, that the mentors have is what's, how much fuel do they have in the tank? So what's their cash position? And uh, are they raising capital right now? Um, what's their cash in the bank? And how many months till burn to zero? In other words, how many months until they're out of money? Um, okay, so then uh, after those small group meetings, there's lunch and after lunch, we move into this format, which is uh, what we call the, lar the large room discussion. So the two people standing up in this image are the founders. So these two are the founders of their particular company. There's no pitching in this program. N they never pitch. Those two founders are standing there. They will spend most of their time standing there listening. Uh, they will say almost nothing. What will happen is um, one of the mentors will introduce the company. So. In this case, the mentors are in the front row. So in the very far left is a woman named Sally Dobb. 
Uh, she's an IP lawyer by training and then a CEO of a um, electronics company. Uh, she's based in Silicon Valley. Sitting beside her, um, the fellow with the black jacket and the white t-shirt, his name's William Tunstall Pado. Uh, he's based in Cambridge, England, and he was the founder of a company called EVI, EVI um, that did natural language processing. And, uh, and his, he sold his company in 2012 to Amazon and uh, his product became the engine driving the Amazon Alexa, uh, which I think is still the number one selling consumer AI product in the world. Then sitting beside him is a fellow called Mo Kermani. Uh, Mo is a physicist. Uh, he built a company called um, Bycast, sold it for a little over hundred million bucks. And now he's a venture investor on the uh, base in Vancouver. Across from him uh, is a fellow uh, who's bald and with a beard. His name's Barney Pell. Uh, Barney is a, uh, also a PhD in artificial intelligence. Uh, then led an 85 person team at NASA that flew the first AI in deep space. Then he built an AI company called PowerSet that he sold to Microsoft. Now he's the co-founder of a company called Moon Express that's building like a Federal Express service to the moon because he believes the moon will be an important gateway for commercial space travel. Sitting beside Barney, uh, the woman with the curly hair is Anusha Ansari. Uh, she was the founder and benefactor of the Ansari X Prize that created the incentives for, for reusable rockets and is the CEO of, a, of an electronics company and based in Texas. And the key point here is that these people are flying in from various cities and in this cohort, they're sitting in, it's an artificial intelligence room. So all the companies in this, in this particular cohort are AI companies. One of these people sitting around in the front row will introduce um, the, the, the company. So they'll say, this is company X. Here's what I like about them. Here's what I don't like. Here's what they're doing that's novel that no one's ever done before. And here's what I think are their key challenges. Then they will say, here's the three objectives that I think they should focus on in the next uh, eight weeks. But you can't see this, but behind these two founders up against the wall is a large MBA uh, uh, screen. And there's a Slack channel that has the three objectives that the uh, mentor, let's say Barney has proposed. After Barney says his thing, then another one of those people in the front row, let's say Anusha sitting beside him, she would say, um, she basically is like a discussant at an academic conference. She critiques those three objectives. So she will have already put into Slack her critiques. She might say, I agree with Barney's objective number one and objective number two, but I disagree with his objective number three. I think that is uh, an important thing to do, but it's not a top priority. A more urgent priority is that they should do this other thing. And then they'll get a, another 11 minutes for that uh, group to debate and discuss what the three objectives would be. In that front row are uh, typically entrepreneur founders. They've built significant businesses. In the second row are venture capital firms. Some of the top VC firms in the world, they fly in from Silicon Valley, from New York, Venrock, uh, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, uh, Highland Capital, Google Ventures, um, Bessemer. Uh, they all fly in in order to have a seat in the second row uh, to, to weigh in on that discussion. The other thing that happens in this room is uh, financing. And so uh, what will often happen is that one of the fellows will say to the, uh, the mentors, uh, we call the mentors either fellows or associates, um, that we'll say, one of the mentors will say, okay, I think one of the objectives should be to, uh, to build a commercial grade, grade prototype. The thing you've built is working very well in the lab. Now we need to see a commercial grade prototype. How much will that cost? And the founders might say, oh, we think that'll cost a half a million dollars to build. And they'll say, okay, then you should raise a million dollar seed round and I'll offer to invest uh, the first 100,000. Um, what happens here uh, is first of all, it's a two-sided market. The people in this room have no obligation to invest and the founders have no obligation to take their capital, but they very often do. And what's even more interesting is when they do make an investment um, within about 72 hours, the phone at the lab, at the creative destruction lab starts to ring and in other investors from around the world start phoning and saying, hey, we heard that so-and-so, we heard that Lee Lau just put in uh, $100,000 into OTI. How can we participate as well? Uh, in fact, there's a fund in California that's been started, it has nothing to do with Creative Destruction Lab, but it's called Creative Destruction Lab Fund, where they've raised money and their investment algorithm is to invest in CDL companies 
when a mentor invests, uh, they offer to invest on the same terms, no further diligence. And I think the reason for that is that, um, first of all, people view that uh, the people in the, in the first and second row have built significant businesses. Uh, they're smart. They're spending significant time with these companies. Uh, and so when they invest, they're both knowledgeable and they're fully aligned. Uh, another interesting point is that uh, we often have guests. There was a guest from Harvard Business School that sat um, and observed this uh, a few years ago. And she said, uh, you have changed the investing process in these early stage process, uh, companies from investing in pictures to investing in movies. Uh, or some people here might think um, investing in cross, change it from investing in cross-sectional data to investing in time series data. So what happens here, especially for these very science oriented companies, um, you know, there's a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty. It's very hard for these companies generally to, you know, work in their lab, work in their basement. And then when they need capital, they put together a slide deck and they go out and they invest, meet with investors and the investors are meeting them for the first time. And so it's very hard for them to invest in some, such a risky proposition upon first sight. What happens in the CDL is that the investors are meeting with these individuals before they even need capital. And furthermore, they're then seeing them on these eight week cycles so that every eight weeks they see the team's ability to perform against a specified set of, of objectives. And so by the time this company needs capital, there's a whole room full of people with investment capacity who have seen them progress over time. The other thing that happens here in the CDL is uh, this is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, it's run at, at a series of universities. Um, the currency for participating, there's no fee, there's no equity stake uh, to participate in this program, but the participation fee is um, performance. Co projects have to perform to stay in the lab. So what happens is at the end of every one of these sessions, uh, the founders are all asked to leave the room. And then we go to the top of the list and we read the names of the companies and their pictures show up on the slides. And we ask who's willing to spend four hours with this company between now and the next session, eight weeks from now. Uh, so four hours means one hour every other week. The people in this room, many of them are extremely wealthy. It's much more expensive for them to commit four hours than it is for, for them to write a check. So basically, that's the pricing mechanism we use to keep companies in the program is, does somebody in this room feel sufficiently intrigued and compelled by these founders that they're willing to commit four hours of their time? And so as long as somebody in the first two rows raises their hand, then uh, the company is invited back to the next session. So there's five sessions, and the ones who make it through all five uh, are, are graduates. So typically, there'll be 25 that start and about half of them will finish and the other half uh, won't make it through the program is, an, is the typical numbers. And so this year uh, uh, that we're about to start, there'll be 625 companies admitted through to CDL through all the different sites. And many sites have more than one cohort and uh, about half of those will graduate. Uh, so just in terms of the layout of the room, um, the those, the, the, the uh, man and woman that were standing at the front, they're the green dots, the venture founders. And then the first two rows are the fellows and associates. The two black dots in the middle are the professors. Uh, they moderate the whole thing. So that's the role of the academics here is that they moderate these sessions and they basically are like orchestra conductors um, between the founders, the fellows and associates. There's also scientists. So uh, one of the ways that we en en enhance the functioning of the market is that there's uh, a number of, of scientists who are top in the world in their field. Uh, they come and they do a technical assessment of the company so that when the mentors ask a technical question, they ask it of the scientists, not the founders. So they get a third party uh, response that has no, uh, no incentive to exaggerate the capability of the technology. Uh, importantly, there's MBA students that are around the perimeter of the, of the room and the MBA students uh, be, they get involved effectively in the area of business development. So they, their role is there's a number of, um, of project types that they do. So for example, let's say there's a technology uh, that where the technology is working well, but there's a very common problem is which market should they enter first? And so the founders generally have no uh, 
training to do an analysis like that. MBAs are very good at that. So the MBAs get paired off. They, they effectively, it's a two-sided market. The MBAs pitch themselves to the founders. The founders pitch themselves to the MBAs. There's a matching algorithm. They get matched and then they work on problems like that. So they're working and they get to see the fruits of their labor over the nine months. They see the companies go from being an idea to being a company, from being not capitalized to being capitalized, to having no employees, to having employees. They go through that whole journey with the uh, founders. So um, I see I'm more or less out of time. I'll just conclude here by saying that uh, it started in 2012 when we launched the lab at University of Toronto in 2012. We had a goal of creating $50 million in equity value, uh, not ourselves, but for the companies that go through the program, uh, 50, 50 million in five years. Uh, we've just finished the eighth year and just crossed $7 billion in equity value created. Uh, so that's the value uh, as priced by investors who invest in these companies. Um, and um, you know, and, the, and the, the number of companies going through the program is increasing uh, just because both the number of sites is increasing and the number of cohorts per site. Uh, and the, there's a number of venture capital firms that are, that are involved in it and so on. And this has been the timeline of development. I'll, I'll pause there so we can take um, questions. Hi, Jay, there are two questions in the Q&A session. Okay. You want to browse through those? Uh, okay, Eugene says so thanks. Uh, if, um, if possible, can you also repeat the questions to the, sure. to the, to the audience? Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, Eugene Kim asks, um, uh, thanks for the talk. Would CDL consider extending the international network in the near future? If so, what expectations, requirements would you and other leading CDL have for the universities potentially interested in joining to establish the lab? Uh, so yes, uh, we are open to other universities joining the network. We look for three things. Um, so we don't do any promotion to other universities because basically every university has tons of entrepreneurship programs. And so um, really they need to, it only works if the university comes to CDL and says they want to do a CDL. Um, so it, it has to be demand pull, uh, demand push just doesn't work for us. So. Uh, when a, a university comes, the three things that we look for are number one, can that university launch a cohort that has the potential to be the best in the world in its field? So for example, we have cohorts in artificial intelligence. We would only do that at an institution that we thought could put together a, a, a group that could be the best in the world in AI startups. So that means, uh, for example, uh, that it's a university that has uh, often, let's say, uh, members of their computer science department uh, are amongst the, the top in the world in their field so that they can send emails to, part to the people we'd want to participate uh, and they would be willing to get on a plane and come for these five sessions because of the people who asked them. So, for example, when we, we recently launched one in the area of space technology and uh, the University of Toronto was very keen to do that, but Toronto is not a center of space technology. And so we said, look, it's not going to work here because we just don't have the community. Then a fellow named Chris Hadfield stepped forward. Chris was the former commander of the International Space Station, and he lives in Toronto. And he said, I, I will lead it. And as soon as he did that, everything changed because then he was able to e directly email Elon Musk, directly email Richard Branson, Lockheed Martin, NASA, and uh, immediately all of those responded and said, yes, they would participate. And so that enabled Toronto to run a program that had, the, had a chance of being best in the world in space, in space tech. So that's uh, issue number one is can, can the site be best in the world in something? Thing number two is, is there a professor uh, that has some uh, gravitas at that university that would champion it? And that's important because there's a lot of bureaucracy at every university uh, that, limits in a thing like this to function properly. And so we need a professor to lead it who's got the capability of navigating the university. And thing number three is there needs to be an industry person who is a, a leader on the industry side who's willing to champion it uh, on the industry side. And so um, an example there is uh, we were in discussions, for example, at Oxford for some time 
about Oxford's interest in launching a, a CDL site. Uh, and they had a great professor in Thomas Hellman, uh, who was leading on the entrepreneurship, who was keen to champion it. And uh, Oxford had the capability of being best in the world in a variety of fields. But uh, there was no industry champion. And so that sat on ice for a year. And then uh, somebody set forward, a fellow named Patrick Pichette, who had been the former CFO at Google uh, for eight years. And he was a Oxford alum, he was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, so Oxford alum. And he had recently stepped down from his role at Google and moved back to London. And so uh, when he raised his hand and said he was willing to lead on the ind industry side, and he had the kind of connections that could ensure that that could be best in the world, then we uh, launched that. Um, okay, so those, those are the three things. Uh, university can be best, uh, the, there's a um, in, uh, professor who's willing to champion it and an in industry leader who's willing to champion it. Um, so Eugenia, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Andrea uh, to ask the structure of CDL, uh, short meetings, no pitching, mixed audience is very interesting and largely unique uh, in, among players in supporting early stage ventures. Clearly it's been successful. How did you come up with the structure methodology when you started the program? Was it like this from the beginning or was there some evolution over time? Um, okay, so uh, this came out of you know, this is my area of research. I've been working in research and commercialization of university science uh, for 20 years. And so many of the people on this call have contributed ideas to this literature. Uh, I, I don't know if she's still on, but at one point I saw Lori Rosenkopf on the call. There's a number of others that whose work uh, has influenced me and, I, and, and we drawed upon when we were designing this, uh, this thing. And furthermore, answering to your question, uh, about evolution, 100% it, it, it's been an evolution. It's been evolving uh, and, and uh, fine-tuning ever since we started. My colleague Joshua Gans often says the most important word in Creative Destruction Lab is lab uh, because it's constant learning and experimenting and evolution. Uh, Ted asked, Ted Worth asked a question here. Um, says, what percent of the companies that have a successful outcome from your program are led by the principal investigator? Do you have any comments on whether the researcher involvement in running the business is necessary, not necessary? That's a great question, Ted. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, let me answer this in three, three quick parts. Part number one is that a number of MBA programs that have like an entrepreneurship program will often do something where they'll have the MBAs start the startups themselves. We specifically chose not to do that because we wanted to make it real. And the issue is that when we bring in investors, investors would look at MBA startups where the MBAs are in the middle of their MBA and they're doing a startup. And they would say, why should I commit my capital to this when you're not even fully committed? Like you're doing all these other courses, you're doing this stuff. In other words, this is just 30% of your time. I'm not gonna commit capital to a thing where the founder's not fully committed. So one of our design principles early on was in order for this to be real, we want the best investors in the world to participate. And for them to participate, the projects have to be uh, real. And the people leading them have to be fully committed. So what that means is that when we have, and we often get this, we get professors who, who apply to Creative Destruction Lab, often from engineering or computer science or the medical school. And, and uh, we're very attracted to them often because they're, they're very often leaders in the world in their field. So they are the best in the world at their particular thing. So that's attractive to us. Um, the downside is they're professors. And, and so, you know, they are not willing to be 100% committed to the business because they are professors. So typically what happens is we will admit them to the program, but they are told at the first session that they, that they have until session three. So they start in, let's say, October. Uh, session one's in October, session two's in December, session three is in February. That they're told that by session three, there's got to be a a new CEO to the business. Otherwise they won't make it past session three. Sometimes that CEO is a grad student. Remember in our field, most grad students, most you know, PhD students go on to, to academe. 
But in engineering, computer science, and medical school, that's often not the case. You know, often some of the very best students uh, go into in industry. So it's not that unusual. And, and so the most common transition is that the professor enters the program as CEO, and then the question is, are they willing to relinquish power to either their grad student or to somebody else by February? Um, and if they don't, if they're still lingering, dragging their feet, they haven't yet figured out who can run the company, no one's as good as them, then they usually get dropped by session three. Um, but grad students who are finishing their PhD and are willing to fully commit, they're often excellent uh, leaders because they know the technology deeply and they're willing to fully commit. Uh, okay, next question is Laurie Rosenkopf. Um, Thanks. Uh, how many applications do you have? Are they simultaneously applying to accelerators or other early stage ven venues? Do you have any data on how accepted applicants prioritize among these options? Okay, great question. Um, so first of all, the CDL, because it doesn't take any equity from participants, um, they are able to do CDL and do other programs. So like, for example, it's the one that they most often are co-doing is, is Y Combinator. Uh, so often they have either done Y Combinator and then they come to CDL, or more often they do the other way around. They do CDL and then uh, they, they go to YC. Um, but it's, it's also, you know, with some other programs. Um, and I, I would say what's becoming even more common is they start at some other incubator on their home university campus. So let's say they're from electrical engineering and the engineering department has some kind of program to help students um, turn their idea into a business. And so they, they've kind of got a very rough draft of that. And then they apply to CDL. The perfect company for CDL is one where they've got some real intellectual property. They've developed a technology that is the best in the world at its thing. And they have an awful business plan. That's the perfect candidate for CDL because they've got a great technology, a terrible business plan, and that's the part that the CDL community is so good at, at fixing the plan and then capitalizing the business. Uh, in terms of the data, I don't think we have that data. We've started collecting a lot of data, Lori, and so if, you're, if it's something you're interested in, um, then uh, just please send me a note separately and I'll, I'll put you in touch with the person who, uh, as far as I know, we now have richer data on the very early stage um, prioritize, priority setting process than any other organization in the world. And the reasons for that is in these meetings, we have a court reporter in every cohort at every site, and they record every word uttered by every investor, every mentor, every founder, every scientist. It's all recorded. And now it's all digitized and it's all searchable in the database. And so, um, you know, we're keeping a lot of detailed records now of what happens from the moment they apply through their nine months journey. And then, and with, with this very detailed data of what happens in these meetings. Um, uh, and we do record now when they are actually participating in other programs, but we don't record uh, the programs that they might have applied to, but didn't get in into. So anyhow, that, that's, uh, only a partial answer to your last part of your question. Um, next question here is Cheryl uh, Smith. Interesting to know that half the companies won't complete the program. Do you have any markers at the start about which may or may not succeed in the program? <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, y yes, we do have markers and our markers have been lousy um, because obviously we, we try and do our best to predict which ones will do well in the program. Uh, but I think we're getting better. And what we've been building is an, an artificial intelligence to, to make these predictions. And now that we're getting more and more data to train the AI, it seems to be getting better. Um, but because we only have a new cohort coming in every year, that we only get to test how much better it is at predicting uh, new entries on a yearly basis. Um, okay, Eric asked the question. Um, have folks explored synergies with other science and apprenticeship programs, uh, such as Stanford University Spark? Uh, 
Not formally, no. Uh, so uh, we, we are aware of companies while they're in Creative Instruction Lab, uh, what other programs they're in, but we haven't done anything formal um, that I'm aware of on the um, economies of scale or scope in terms of participating in, in the multiple uh, programs. There's, there's probably about a dozen research projects that are going on right now with the CDL data. And so I'm not, I'm not um, aware of all the details of all of them, but to my knowledge, nobody's working on that question yet. Um, okay, so I think, oh no, there's a few more questions here. Um, oh, Conwall asks, how do we select mentors on the panel? <sighs> Great question. Um, so we look for three kinds of mentors. The first kind, so first I should say, we have cohorts that are, most of the cohorts are specialized. And when we launched Creative Destruction Lab originally, the, the cohorts were general. And we still have, at each site, there's usually one general cohort. So that's a, a catch-all. They take technologies from any domain. We call it prime. And so um, uh, when we launched CDL in 2012, we only had one prime stream. Uh, then in 2015, we added the second cohort, and that was one focused on, art on just artificial intelligence companies. And when we did that, a lot of people said, oh, that's not going to work. There's not enough AI companies. There's not enough interest in AI. Um, there's not enough investors and so on, which sounds crazy now, but that's what, when we were putting together in 2014, that's what people were saying about the program that would launch in 2015. In fact, it was the opposite. What happened was when we created the specialized program, um, that because now we had 25 companies that were all artificial intelligence oriented, that while there were fewer people in Toronto, especially on the investor side, that were specialized in that, that it was enough of a critical mass to attract the best AI investors from anywhere in the world. So up till 2015, CDL was a very parochial operation. It was mostly founders from, from around Toronto, investors from around Toronto, uh, scientists from around Toronto, everything was very Toronto oriented. The minute we focused on AI, and now we had 25 AI companies, uh, the AI companies started applying from all over the world and the investors, that's when we first started getting a rush of investors from Silicon Valley because it's, you know, they wouldn't have come for a, a general cohort that had two AI companies, but now they had, we had 25 companies that were all in this domain. Uh, if you were focused on that sector, then it was worth getting on a plane and coming. And so think, you know, it was shocking to us because, you know, these are very often uh, VCs at places like um, Highland Capital and, and Andreessen Horowitz and Google Ventures. These are investors that won't even drive down the 101 or the 280 between San Francisco and San Jose because they say the traffic's too much of a hassle. They're getting on a plane and flying to Toronto every eight weeks. Um, so that became like we realized, okay, something, something important here has just happened. And so to answer your question, um, we, we uh, select mentors based on three things. First off, if it's a specialized stream, uh, we look for domain expertise. So let's say in the artificial intelligence stream, what's their expertise in AI? Or in the space stream, what's their expertise in space? Or in the energy stream, what's their expertise in, in, in um, in energy. Uh, we have somewhere here something that says, oh, this thing here shows what the different specializations are. Um, the second thing we look for is, have they been a founder operator? So in other words, uh, there's a big difference between people who, let's say, talk about AI versus people who have built and operated AI companies. So we look for um, uh, mentors who have themselves built uh, companies. So even in the AI stream, when the field was first taking off, there was not a lot of people who built AI companies. So we were looking for people that had just built software companies. So one is domain expertise. Two is, uh, are they a builder, an operator? And three is uh, investment track record. Uh, and so what we look for here is how many checks have you written in the last 12 months and what's the average check size? Now, some people we will invite onto the panel if they are a superstar in one domain even if they're weaker in the other domains. 
Uh, so let's say we will invite someone who is a, a, you know, a top 10 world expert in artificial intelligence, even if they haven't made a bunch of investments. Or alternatively, we'll uh, invite someone who is uh, being a serial founder, founded many successful companies, had very significant exits, even if they don't know anything about AI uh, and so on. But those are the three things that we look for, um, Conwell. Uh, next question from Ufa, is it possible to have access to CDL data? You can send a note and um, apply what's your research question and then uh, we go through a process of ethics for getting you know, what's the use of the data and all of that and then, and then uh, yes. Uh, Shyam says, greetings from RPI. Can you share what sectors and technologies have transitioned through CDL? Yeah, so that's uh, Shyam, that's on this, uh, this uh, slide here. So uh, a lot in health. We have two streams in health at CDL West in Vancouver. Uh, we're just opening uh, two streams in uh, climate, uh, climate technology, climate change technology, one at CDL West at UBC and the other at HSA Paris. Um, then we have three in artificial intelligence, one in Toronto, Montreal, and uh, Oxford. Um, we, and so on, you can see on the list here, we're just opening one now in agriculture tech uh, we've got one in energy tech uh, in Toronto. We've also got blockchain, uh, material science, quantum computing, and space. Um, in Atlanta, we're focused on on economic recovery from the pandemic. Uh, so technologies that are focused on on that. Uh, so that that's the the range so far. Um, Young Wook asks, how has the operation of CDL changed after the spread of COVID nineteen? Do you now plan to have mostly activities online? If so, what are the examples of adjustment? Okay, great question. Um, so yes, uh, we built an online platform. Uh, thankfully, we have an executive director named Sonia Senek, and she was um, really incredible. She saw this happening in February before any of the, you know, it really became a thing in the Western newspapers. Um, and so we got to work building a platform to run the entire sessions online. It's much more complex than just doing a Zoom meeting. Um, I won't go into all the details now, but th there's a lot of um, machinery to make these meetings go, the small group meetings, the big group meetings, all the documents they have, the different levels of access to these documents. Some are more public than others. Um, how the, the, uh, the objectives are presented in these meetings when everything's online, how the critique of the objectives is done, uh, all of that stuff, um, we've integrated a Slack channel for all the comments. And so every company has its own Slack channel thread. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. And what happened is that the team uh, built a portal, an online portal, in order to move everything that was done offline, online. What we did not expect, but has happened since then, is it has really made this entire operation much more global. So now... When we do an artificial intelligence session, for example, in Toronto, the, the, uh, the mentors who are part of the AI stream at Oxford also like to participate. And same, uh, you know, the ones who are doing climate in the West Coast, in North America, now want to participate in the one in Paris. And so other than some time zone issues, um, it's really made this thing very uh, uh, global and much more easy. So for example, a lot of the, the VCs who are in other parts of the world, for example, we have a lot more from Hong Kong now that are uh, in participating as investors. Um, they, they were coming occasionally before, uh, but the flight was so significant that it was a restriction. Now they are participating very actively. So um, yes, this made this, uh, it's really lit up CDL made it far more global made, and also made the community more global. So now, you know, people are developing personal relationships with other experts in their field on the science side, the investing side and the mentorship side um, via the, the online platform. Um, okay, five minutes left. Jenny asks, do you also limit the number of VCs? The room map look pretty small. How do you choose? Big names only. Um, Yes. Uh, so first of all, hi, Jenny. Nice to see you or see your question. Um, and um, so the way that it was done before, before COVID, was by seats in the room. So um, in the very beginning, when we first started Creative Destruction Lab, it 
you know, this was really personal relationships. It was, it was, you know, it was me. This was my, uh, you know, uh, kind of class project. And I was asking VCs and entrepreneurs that I knew to do it. Now it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm um, a very tiny piece of the puzzle. And so uh, there's many VCs and entrepreneurs that come to CDL and ask, can they, uh, can they participate? Uh, especially a lot of younger VCs um, who view this as a way to, um, uh, you know, connect to a broader community and to start developing a relationship. Because of the way the conversations are moderated by the professors, it's a good way for very smart VCs to basically signal to others how smart they are. So uh, what we do is we have a pretty rigorous evaluation process. Uh, the way we did it before capping it was by seats in the room. So we would have, let's say, you know, seats for 10 VCs and we would go and who's the best, uh, who is the best qualified to be in this room? So for example, if you're a VC with a PhD in artificial intelligence, that's good. If you're a VC that's got a track record of investing in AI companies, that's good. Um, if you're a VC that's part of a firm that's making uh, significant follow-on investments uh, to help their AI companies grow, that's good. So we'd look for various things um, and select that way. And also the commitment. So we would often, we'll try people. So if someone looks promising, we'll bring them in uh, on a conditional basis. And then we see how they perform in the room. How good are their comments? How valuable are their connections that they offer to the founders in the Slack channel? How valuable do the MBA students view them as um, when they're giving advice to the MBAs? We have scores for all those things. So everyone gets scored inside CDL. There's like a point system. And so you basically, everyone evaluates uh, how, you know, they, they, don't, they don't give negative grades to anyone. They just give positive grades. Who's been the most helpful to me as a student? Who's been the most helpful to me as a founder? And so we can see who stands out. And that way we know who to formally invite uh, and not. Um, okay. And Atanu Ghosh uh, says, any partner in India? Uh, not yet. We've had some preliminary conversations with um, the IIM in, in uh, Bangalore and Mumbai, uh, but that's only been preliminary. Nothing has advanced into anything material yet. And I think that's it. Um, Wesley, I have one minute left yes. and I'm through the questions. Yeah. Do the audience, does the audience have any other questions? Ask all for questions, okay. Uh, seeing that there are no more questions, uh, I just like to thank uh, Dr. Ajay Agra on behalf of SMS and the EN, uh, ENS Interest Group. Thank you for your time uh, spent with us. And the audience, please look forward to our next webinar uh, in a month or so. Thank you all.